Um, hi, everybody. I'm Gautam Arora. Um, and I'm here to talk to you about taking your applications from localhost to production. Uh, now, I do realize that it's a very large topic. Uh, production me can mean a lot of different things, right? It can mean the code that we write and the best practices involved. It could mean about the servers. It could be about CI, CD pipelines. It could be about configuration management. It could be about monitoring. It could be about so many different things. But we have to pick a topic for today and uh, talk about that. So what I will be focusing on is uh, understanding the building blocks for web application delivery. And I'll walk through you uh, on why I believe that is a very important topic. And I feel uh, that's something that needs to be discussed more, um, especially if you are like a JavaScript developer. A uh, little bit about myself, um, I'm uh, a director of developer evangelism and growth at Condé Nast, um, and I'll touch a little bit on what Condé Nast does. I'm a co-organizer of New York JavaScript, where I work with a lot of developers in my community, and I have uh, been seeing a lot of questions that, I, uh, that come from them. These are developers that are just getting started with uh, React, with Node, and they know how to get their applications off the ground really quickly. And that's the beauty of the JavaScript ecosystem that we live in, right? Like you just write a few lines of code, you do create React app, and your application is in production. Um, and when I say production, I mean it runs on Heroku or something, right? And uh, then you get a real job in a real company, and they give you access to production systems, and you're a little clueless. You're like, I don't know how this was all set up. Uh, the other day on Reddit, I don't know if you saw that uh, article about somebody who deleted their production database while they were getting on onboarded. And those problems are real. Um, when I joined uh, a large organization myself, I used to be worried about that. I was always worried about bringing my site down. So we'll talk about my worries, uh, which I'll get into in detail. Um, I'm also a curator of a website called fullstackjs.com. Um, this was basically my learnings from uh, basically trying to understand all the different pieces that come together that make uh, our special snowflake uh, flake of an application. Uh, there are so many different pieces to learn about, and I think uh, Paul touched uh, on it in the keynote today, that it's so important for us to be aware of the larger systems that come into play. Uh, so fullstackjs.com, it touches on that, and uh, if you want to talk to me, I'm Gotham on Twitter. Uh, so a little bit about Conny Nast. What is Conny Nast? Conny Nast is a magazine publisher. Uh, we, uh, you might know us through our brands like Wired, Ars Technica, Vanity Fair, Vogue, GQ, Conny Nast Traveler, Epicurious, Bon App. So basically a large collection of websites. And um, what we focus on is serving a large global audience. So we have a global audience of over 100 million. And uh, we have a lot of these brands, and we focus on user experience. So a lot of our team members are uh, rock star front-end developers and are always thinking about building high-performing web applications. Um, at, um, at a very like 10,000-foot level view, the way we are set up is very similar to any traditional organization. Uh, we use a content management system API that is built on top of Node. Um, you could use WordPress. You could use Drupal. At the end of the day, you basically need an API that has all of this content. And we've built a system of our own that we use, use uh, uses Node, uses HappyJS. Um, on top of that are all our brand site experiences. Uh, we have uh, about, like, for if you have 20 brands, we have 20 brand teams. Each of these brand teams build these websites. So now we have a lot of diversity in the different stacks that they're using. Uh, so we are working on standardization across those stacks. And on top of that, uh, you have heard of new technologies coming, like Google AMP, uh, Facebook Instant Articles, Apple News. So we, because we are a publisher, we always have to stay on top of these things, and we have to keep building for these different platforms. Uh, so we have a team that is dedicated to building uh, distribution platforms, as well as building chatbots, building VR, building AR, all the cool stuff. Uh, the reason that I've highlighted uh, Traveler over there is because before I uh, joined Dev Evangelism, I was the tech lead at Corinna's Traveler. And um, a little bit about myself was that I had previously been a Java developer. I know everybody's like, what, Java? Uh, like giving away your age. So I was a Java developer and then a PHP developer in a startup, and I felt I was very shielded by my DevOps teams. Like, 
if I, I never had to worry about anything server-side. Like, I would just like do my code, write my queries, ship it away. The DBA would make sure that the queries were all good and would tell me when they weren't, and then my DevOps folks would make sure that the application is performing well. I just focused on code, wonderful. But uh, when I became a tech lead and joined Con and Ast, I realized my team of four people was responsible for everything. We were responsible for the front-end code, the back-end code, the servers, the security, it's everything. And I had nightmares. I would, I would always worry that my site will go down, and down it did. It wasn't that like, you know, we're building these sites and we've got our act together, like nothing's going down. No, they would go down. I remember being at a party and I'm getting pager duty calls where my site is down because bots are hitting our site and there's too much traffic on the node servers and we can't handle it. And at that moment when I'm scrambling, I have no clue what I'm debugging. I'm like that, like, I'm trying to figure this out. I have no clue what is going on. I'm like, looking, looking at logs on node, look at logs on Nginx, look at logs on CDN. Why is this happening? Why didn't we set this up correctly? So those are real issues that happen in production systems. I would worry that my site is too slow. Who here has used PageSpeed Insights? to kind of test their website performance. I know, doesn't make you feel good or bad. They give you this score, <laughs> and they tell you, they're like, you're bad, it's like you're poor. Like, and they give you these like 15 things that you should do to your website, and you start reading through them, and they're like, do gzip compression, and make sure they're not async scripts, and like, I don't know who you're talking to, because nobody taught me in the tutorial that I, that I read through, and now I'm a developer at a job, and now you're telling me I'm bad. First you tell, told me I was great. Uh, so, but suddenly Google's judging you, and if you, if you feel judgment, uh, you should try out Lighthouse, which is the tool that they're using for PWS coding. Like, you'll feel super bad about yourself. Um, and we had like an internal dashboard where we would have 20 teams and we would compare their Google speed scores. So imagine being inside and like 20 teams and you're being ranked and you're seeing your team in a super low score. Imagine the morale of that team. <laughs> like, oh, that's horrible. Um, and apart from that, uh, I was also worried about the fact that I was using all the wrong tools. Uh, I was a Node developer, and like, I say I'm a Node developer, um, that basically because I had two applications that I had put on Heroku. So yay me, I was a Node developer. Um, and, but I was always worried that I was using the wrong tools. Like any question, my product manager came to me, they're like, hey Gotham, we have this new feature. How, where do we do this? And I'm like, I think I, I know how to do this in Node. I, I think I know how I can code this up. Uh, I would go look at Express middlewares, and I'm like, ah, oh, God, it is an Express middleware to do whatever it is that I want to do. And soon, I, my application was just a bunch of like you know NPM modules because we're like this this ecosystem is amazing, right? Everybody has done the hard work for us in open source, and we really don't have to think hard. We just take the module, drop it in, and it works great. But is that the right thing to do? I don't know. Nobody's telling me what the right thing to do is. And while we are building systems and like, you know, these large interactions between, like, I have a web server and an API server, and then I have this new chatbot that I'm writing, and my uh, microsites have to be developed. If anybody's in publishing, you have a lot of like, tentpole moments where you create small websites that live on your parent site but are built by a vendor, and you try to integrate them, and their ads and their analytics, and the system is like a spaghetti. Like, I'm not even talking about the code, I'm talking about the system. The system is a mess. And we are working on Node, and we've been working on it for like, you know, two, three years, and we are feeling the pain. Imagine, like, you know, somebody is working on code bases that are larger than that. This, this issue is more prevalent in our entire industry. It's not just about Node.js, it's a lot of larger problem um, that we have to tackle. So today what I'm going to be talking about is how I got over some of those fears, how I saw light at the end of the tunnel, and how I was able to make sure that my site is up, it's fast, I'm using the right tools, and it's good complex. I say good complex, and you're like, you just invented a word, that's not a word. Yes, that is true. Uh, complexity will always be there in our systems. Uh, for anybody who tells you that like, you know, there's not going to be any complexity, uh, they're lying to you. There is always going to be complexity in our code, in our systems, and we need to get okay with that. Uh, if you're managing multiple servers, multiple sites, get over it. Like, you know, let's start accepting that there's complexity in our systems, and we need to teach ourselves to be a better developer. Uh, better developer. 
And that leads to the point, again, uh, what Paul was talking about. Uh, we as developers have a lot of responsibility. We can't live in our bubbles and say, hey, I just know about front end and I only know about React and rest of the node folks, I really don't care about what your backend is written in. Uh, similarly, the node folks need to be a little more empathetic to the DevOps team and make sure we are more knowledgeable about the cloud ecosystem and what are the capabilities and what are the tools available there. And same goes for the DevOps folks. It's like a, it's a cycle that we all need to go through. And uh, like I, w I was having this conversation with a few developers and they were like, yeah, I get, I get what you're saying. You mean a full stack developer, I'm a full stack developer. And I was like, yeah, but what about the cloud? Like, why aren't you like embracing the cloud? Why aren't you learning more about it? And they were like, oh, but full stack only says front end and back end. So I came up with another term called a fuller stack developer. And a fuller stack developer also uses uh, DevOps. Uh, and uh, if you're planning to learn AI, then yeah, you fall into my definition of a fuller stack developer. Um, so today, uh, getting into the talk, we'll be talking about bridging the boundaries between node and cloud and what, why I believe that is, that is important for, um, for uh, web application delivery. Um, let's, let's get started with the meat of the presentation. Uh, imagine you're a developer. Uh, your experience with Node has been that uh, you know that you can, you, you read a tutorial, you found out, you wrote an app.js uh, file, which is basically a JavaScript code, you run it on your terminal or hyperterm, um, and you run it, and it spins up a server, and on the browser you can access it. That's great. Our production systems are very similar, right? You do something similar, you run some commands, they go onto the cloud, they're working in the cloud, and browser works. Like, you're like, my job here is done, got to go home now. Um, but that is, that is not, that is the part where I feel this cloud is what I want to you and myself to be better aware of. Uh, so I started this journey a couple of years ago and started to understand the cloud a little better. Uh, I said, okay, let me understand a little bit about Node. So if anybody is Google for like, you know, Express or Node best performance practices, you'll end up on this page. Uh, and this, this is on the Express documentation, which is very good. And they'll give you these like things to do in your code and things to do in your environment and setup. And they also mentioned that setup thing is like an ops thing. So you're like, oh, I'm, I, I'm not going to do it. Uh, it's probably the ops people are responsible for that. But today what we will do is we'll actually go into that world and see what is it that the ops guys do. Similarly, if you're interested in the cloud, you will actually end up on AWS website. And they're amazing. Like, like it's, if you talk about JavaScript fatigue, like look at this. This is like AWS fatigue. Like I don't even know where to get started. Like, I am interested, I want to get into this world, I'm actually like taking the first step and saying I want to know more about the cloud and like AWS is like, yeah, tell me where you want to start. Um, and then you start reading reference documentations and they have 3D diagrams and it's like, I'm not sure why they had to move it in 3D, but they show you that there is this application server and database behind it and in front of it there are big boxes and when I first looked at this, I thought they were buildings. So I was like, I don't know, do I need a full building for this? But they didn't get the point across. And then you keep searching because you're not getting your answers. And there is this one talk that is fascinating. It's every year on AWS reInvent. Uh, reInvent is AWS's conference. Uh, and there's one talk that has happened every year at AWS reInvent. Uh, it is a talk which basically says how to scale your web applications. So even if I, what I've said till now, you're like, no, but he works in a publishing company. I don't care. I work in a startup. I only care about like, you know, building e-commerce applications that are like, you know, that are today going to be one user and tomorrow going to be 10 million users. They actually walk through like all the steps required and by the end you get to it and like it's like it's that good complex sort of diagram that I showed. It's like so many systems working together and if you have no idea how do you put them together, you're going to be a little clueless. So what I needed to learn for myself was build a baseline knowledge for the cloud and then come up with practical starting points. Uh, the reason I say practical starting points is because I feel as developers, we are spoiled by create React app and express generator. We just run a few commands, we get the application and we run it. Something like that does not exist in the cloud or at least I did not know. So I wanted to change that. 
Uh, the rest of this talk, I will talk about how you can do more with Node, how you can do more with Nginx, and we'll get into what Nginx is, how you can do more with CloudFront. There are tools that I will use, and I'll show you some screenshots. And all the code for this is available on my GitHub. Uh, I will be posting this website. So you can actually go by the end of this talk. Hopefully, you will be able to set up like a production system with a CDN, with an elastic load balancer and stuff. And you'll be like, wow, I can get that done. So where do you begin? Uh, when you start reading uh, documentation around production systems, the first thing that a node developer comes across is something called node clusters. What is node cluster? Uh, traditionally, when we run node applications, there is no cluster. No cluster means that your application runs on a single CPU. We've all heard that, and we're like, yeah, that's what makes node awesome, right? And now you're telling me that's not? Like, why are you, why are you breaking this for me? And the reason that is, is because node will, is run on a single thread on a single CPU. But when you run in production systems, you might have multiple CPUs. And in order to use multi-core systems, you should run your application on multiple cores. Now, that is phenomenal, right? It's like having an internal load balancer that in your application performance just is like four times, right? You're using all cores, and of course it won't be four times, but you get the idea, it increases. And how it works is actually very simple. You have a cluster master, and all these terms hopefully make sense, right? It's like you have a master, slave, you've heard of those concepts. So you have like master, you have cluster workers. So master starts multiple workers. You're like, life is beautiful. I just increased my throughput of my application, and like, I'm better at production systems. And um, to do it itself, like, it's very easy. Like, the code for it is on GitHub. Of course, you can even Google for it, and Stack Overflow has all the answers for it. So there's nothing special in this code. It's just being aware of the concept, not about the code. It's never about the code. And you're like, hey, I have heard of this, what you're talking about. I actually can use PM2. I don't even need your code, and that's great. Like, maybe you don't want to. Maybe you want to use that approach. But then, the important part to identify is, should you be even doing this? Because uh, here's a tweet from Rod Wag, who is uh, on the Node Technical Committee, and he posted this picture the other day. He said, Node cluster modules idea of load balancing, and he shows this like cycle, like, which has, uh, which I think is a cycle, but it's, it's a system, and uh, like a production system, which you don't understand, and there's this red bolt in the middle. And I didn't get in on the joke, and I'm like, what? Like, and people are laughing, and they're like, ha-ha, this is funny. And I'm like, I don't get it. The reason is, underlying to node clusters, node clusters use the operating system to decide how to split the load between the different worker threads. Now, what it happens is, and you would believe that the OS knows what it's supposed to do, right? But in production systems, it's been seen that even if you have four to five processes, the OS will tend to send all the traffic to two processes, which will basically mean that you are not really optimizing your application and you're not really using the four cores. So this can bite you in the back. Like we've had production issues where a few workers have died and we've not realized that those workers died. They didn't tell the master and then we've identified that it is because of this, these issues. So even though you know you can use Node Cluster, even though the Express documentation says use Node Cluster, you should think about it, and you should be aware of the issues. Uh, in fact, you're like, okay, then what do I do? Not going to use Node Clusters? You just said they're awesome. Uh, in fact, uh, if you read, uh, this is uh, uh, from GitHub on the HappyJS, which is another web framework, uh, their uh, lead, he says, we do not uh, recommend Node Clusters. In fact, we say you should use single core VMs to run our setup. And again, when I first read this, I was like, I don't know what he's talking about. And, uh, but now, having learned a little bit, I know what he's talking about is that when you spin up EC2 instances, these EC2 instances can have a single core. So if you are a developer who is basically using EC2 instances that have a single core, you really don't need node cluster. Right? So that's the gist of this. We can use node clusters. Should we use node clusters? Probably not. Um, but if you want to disregard everything I said and you're like, nope, I still want to use node clusters, here's simple steps to do it. Again, you don't have to take notes. All the slides will be available, but I want to give you an idea on how much effort does it take to get from A to B. Uh, you will basically install the AWS CLI. You will 
run your instance. Actually, I've been using the AWS console a lot, the website, to do it. But now, ever since I've learned, you can actually do everything use, uh, using the CLI, which is pretty awesome. And then you log into your box. Um, you install Node on the box, which is like you know, a fairly complicated process. Uh, uh, you can get an AMI, but I haven't found a good AMI. Uh, you can install the Node cluster. Uh, you can check out my code from GitHub, and you can run it. Like, there's nothing fancy about it. Once you understand the concept behind what node clusters is, what it represents, when to use it, the code fades away in the background. OK, so we now know one thing about the cloud. We know that we've got, uh, we've, we, from our terminal, can spin up node applications. They can go into the cloud, and this node application lives over there. Now let's talk about something else, the second part, Nginx. What is Nginx? Why is it called Nginx? I don't know. I actually tried looking for why they're called Nginx. Didn't find any good answer. But I found this. It says, don't use Node.js for static content, um, tag smart person. Um, if Nginx isn't sitting in front of your Node server, you're probably doing it wrong. And like, it's kind of that thing when Google PageSpeed Insights gives you a poor score, where you know something is bad, but you really don't know what to do about it. Right? So, um, I started reading up on what Nginx is, and like, you know, for those who've done Apache and those who've built production websites, they must be like, yeah, of course we know what Nginx is, of course we know. But for a wide variety of developers who don't have that background, Nginx can mean a lot of things. I used to see these like, videos, and they were like, Nginx can do everything. Nginx can like, save you from, like, you know, can save your life. And I would wonder what that really means. I tried to break it down, and this is what I took away. Nginx does three good things. Reverse proxy, load balancer, content accelerator. Let's talk about them. Reverse proxy. First of all, I never understood this concept of a reverse proxy. What do you mean by a reverse proxy? Like, you know, I understand proxies let traffic through, but reverse, is it like sending my traffic back? Like, that never, like, I, I was confused uh, about, like, what, why use the word reverse proxy? Uh, it was probably a term made by smart people so that, like, you know, they could, they could confuse me. Uh, but the idea here is that it acts uh, like an endpoint, a single entry into your network, basically into the back of your network. So if that's all you take away, reverse proxies are just basically entry points into your systems. Uh, Nginx, as a reverse proxy, can act as a single origin, so that's another word to use, origin. Origin is basically, it can, you can have your node application behind it, or you can have different node applications behind that. That's what it does. It's a reverse proxy. It also does load balancing, which if we kind of remember, that's what node was doing with node cluster. And it also is a content accelerator, which basically means that instead of hitting your node application, it can hit a cache and get data from there, as well as it can do gzip, which means basically it can compress the data for you, which is wonderful. Uh, so basically now we know Nginx, that's, what, that's all that it does. But let's focus on why we should use Nginx. Like, we know we should use it, but why are we using this? What makes Nginx so much ama amazing, right? So when you read about it, Nginx has an event-driven, asynchronous architecture. So you think about it, you're like, wait, I thought that's what made Node special, right? Node has an asynchronous architecture. They said event-driven. It's similar. And you will realize that Nginx has a very similar architecture to Node. In fact, uh, going through the documentation, you also realize it has a master, and it spins up multiple workers. Now, where have we seen that before? Like, I think I've seen that before. I just showed it to you like two slides ago. It was basically the same node cluster idea. So now the whole thing becomes clearer to us that this is not rocket science. This is actually the same concept of having masters in workers. Great. And we know Nginx does that. That is fabulous. Um, I know some of you are still curious. You're like, is it really performant? And this is the best I could find. Uh, it's from the Nginx uh, website. It says, pulling numbers from thin air for illustrative purposes, serving 10,000 simultaneous connections would probably only cause Nginx to use a few megabytes of RAM, while Apache would not be able to do it. And I'm pretty sure Node won't be able to do it either. And that's a picture of a guy pulling numbers from thin air, but you get the idea. Don't worry too much about the performance right now. Focus on the concepts. Cool. Now that we've done that, you will see there's another, another concept that we touched on, load balancing. But what is a load balancer? A load balancer, as many know, would basically be splitting your traffic amongst different instances. 
AWS has this concept of an elastic load balancer, which basically puts your Nginx and Node applications in a single zone and says the load balancer is going to manage that. We know Nginx could have done it for us, but AWS's Elastic Load Balancer can also do that for us. The hearts that I've drawn over there are not because like, you know, the Node and Nginx love each other, which they kind of do, they're best friends, but the hearts represent there are health checks that are made where this Elastic Load Balancer can basically make sure that your instances are up and running so that your site is not going down. Every time your instances go down, Elastic Balan Load Balancer creates more instances. That is fabulous, but when I was doing this, I was like, this is great. I understand the theory, but how do I practice that? Like, I want to do this. I want to have Node with Nginx and Elastic Load Balancers. I want to play with this because that's how we learn, right? We developers, we put things up and we are like, we want to break it. We want to see how that works. And for me, the best, uh, what I found was there's a concept called Elastic Beanstalk, which is another product by Amazon, where they basically give you the same idea. If you see, it's an Elastic Load Balancer. It's got web app servers with Nginx and Node. They're put in an elast uh, auto-scaling group concept we don't get into right now, but this is the same idea. You as developers, we can actually go try it today and see how this would work in our production systems. And that's, that's what I wanted us to do. So how do we set this up? Again, super simple. We install the Elastic Load Balancer CLI. We run a few commands, which is basically saying which region we are, want to create this uh, Beanstalk application in, and we give it the platform, Node.js, it creates that. Like, literally, the, the barrier to entry for someone from knowing how to use Nginx and load balancing is very easy. It's knowing that these tools are available to us. Uh, a bit about the Beanstalk configuration. This is how you can very quickly define how to put your applications together. The reason I'm showing this is because there are concepts like configuration management and how do you kind of make sure that uh, you're putting the right number of instances. This can help you over there. As you can see, this is literally the entire file. This is not too much code. This is like the entire file and it's available on GitHub. Um, so now we have learned a little bit more about the cloud. Now we know that there is an elastic load balancer, there is Nginx, and there is Node. Hopefully these concepts make more sense now. Um, how have I used these in production? We use, um, like you know, many of us are using Node applications, building multiple applications. Um, in the last two years, I have had three Node production applications. Three applications using three different frameworks, using three different front ends. Why am I doing that? Am I crazy? Can't I make up my mind? It's actually because Node keeps changing. The ecosystem is evolving. So instead of tying myself to a certain architecture, we make sure we are allowing our developers to have the flexibility to use the tools that they want. So when we had to write our API, we created another Node application and let Nginx route that traffic to that API. We are moving to HappyJS. We created the HappyJS app and had a subset of our routes just go to HappyJS. And we had everything else in our site go to Express application. Before that, I have actually written a proxy in Node myself multiple times with a lot of bugs that have taken like, like quarters to find and fix. Why did I do that to myself? It's because I didn't know better. And I think that is key. Knowing our tools makes us better developers. It's not about the lines of code we write, it's about knowing our tools because smarter developers have written these tools for us and we should know when to leverage them. The proxy configuration, again, this is available, but it's very simple. Literally five lines of code in the middle is all I needed to get that setup working. The reason that I never knew how to use that setup is because I did not have an environment where I could set all of this up and test it in the cloud. Uh, in the cloud. The, today we have that, so I would encourage you to definitely try it out. And the final part of this talk is about the CloudFront CDN. I know the first time somebody talk, talked to me about a CDN, I thought it was the most boring thing ever. It stands for Content Delivery Network. I'm like, who talks about CDNs? That's like boring. Like, you know, you were talking about Akama, you're like, yeah, I know they exist, I know they're important, but like, who really cares? I don't worry about that too much. But um, like, 
if anybody reads TechCrunch, right? Uh, so the other day I came across this article um, which touches on a few aspects that what I'm talking about today is there is a disruption in content delivery networks. It says dev teams really have no idea how the site will run until they get into production. I think he's talking about me. Um, <laughs> I had no clue. Um, future of web application delivery platform, developers have full control over reverse proxy configuration, experiment in testing environment. This could be you tomorrow. He, this, these guys are giving all that access to you. So we all better know how to use that reverse proxy configuration, right? So we need to be aware of these systems. So at a high level, I know this is the part that everybody understands about CloudFront or CDNs. CloudFront is Amazon's CDN. There are Akamai, there's Fastly, there's Cloudflare, uh, all of the systems. CloudFront is just one such example. Uh, it's a content delivery network. It's got multiple edge locations, which basically means it's a distributed network all over the globe. Uh, it's across five continents. That's great. And it reduces network latency. So you can have your server in America uh, or Europe, and your content delivery network is spread all over the world, and it works that way. That is great. But how I, as a developer, can make that content delivery network more accessible to myself? First, I need to understand what a content delivery network can do. It is more than just content delivery and file caching. A content delivery network, voila, has the same concept. It's a reverse proxy. Same concept comes again. Same thing we read about in Nginx. It is a single origin. It's a multi-origin. Multi-origin is interesting because Amazon has other infrastructure, like S3, that you can put some of your static files in. And if you saw one of the previous slides, we mentioned that we should not put our static files on Node.js. We then, as developers together, made the decision that we will put those static files in Nginx, because that's the right thing to do. And now Amazon has this infrastructure for S3, so we should probably move our files to the edge and have the CDN use that. Uh, it can also work as a content accelerator, so basically it has a cache that it can use. And this one's really interesting. It actually has a concept of a scale cache, which basically means if your site is down, your CDN will not let the user even know. And we'll get into details of that. So that's literally what a production system looks like. It's actually that simple. You have a CloudFront CDN. You have an S3 bucket in which you put your static assets. You have an ELB, which is a load balancer. You have Nginx, and you have Node. And hopefully, this picture, which is the same idea that you saw in the AWS reference architecture of buildings and uh, of the different kind of like you know uh, diagrams that AWS provides, this is a simpler representation of what skills you need to be able to understand the cloud. It's literally that simple. But now, this, this was the hard part for me. I almost, like, you know, when I was preparing this presentation, I, at this part, I, felt, I thought I'm going to give up because I really didn't know how to put all of this together. I spoke to many DevOps engineers. I was like, I want this setup because I want to talk to developers and I want to show them how to create this environment in the cloud. I want to do this for real. We'll do a live demo um, of that. Uh, but it was hard. I spent a lot of time trying to understand what the right tools are. What I then realized that a system like this, when you're making a system that is so complex, that has so many moving parts, what you use is you use a template. You don't even use something like a managed service like Beanstalk. You use a template. So uh, what is that template like? It looks like this. It is a cloud formation template. Again, uh, it's a long template. Uh, I won't. Uh, I definitely agree. This is this is challenging. This is hard to kind of like understand the entire template. I don't think I fully completely understand. I work with my DevOps teams, and we have like internal uh, templates that they provide for spinning up our architecture. But at least now I can read the template. I understand the various concepts that are associated about a template. And once you have the template, uh, what you can really do is with like a single command, which is the first command, which will take you 12 minutes. So I'm not going to do a, uh, a demo of that. It takes 12 minutes to spin up that architecture. Uh, you say AWS CloudFormation, create stack, you give the name of your stack, you give the template body, and then you give certain parameters. You basically need one parameter, which is your uh, key, and that's it. With a single command, you can actually have access to a production environment. 
And this environment is very similar to what, like, you know, when you join an organization uh, and if you're learning, like, that's the production environment they will have. Spinning up a stack, it's actually very easy. You can see all the different instances uh, that come in. What's really interesting is now that you have the stack up, you can debug the entire thing with curl. If you've used curl, it's an amazing command. It gives you, like, you know, it, you can basically learn a lot more about HTTP as a developer using curl. So here are some sample ideas. You can basically test the headers. You can test your gzip cache headers. You can test your e-tag headers. You can test your network latency. All of these concepts that were hard to touch and understand are now very accessible to us. So that's pretty much it. That's like kind of like, you know, now we know how this production system sets up. We know that in terms of a performance point of view, I know some of you are thinking, well, wait, if CDN is so great, should I just like stop doing what I'm doing as a developer? Is the front end developer not as important? But hopefully, this diagram, sh uh, this table uh, shows you that they work hand in hand. Just because I am claiming that a CDN is going to make it faster does not mean that the front-end developer is off the hook or that it does not matter what the JavaScript performance is on the browser. That is also very important. And that's why when we are building applications, it is our responsibility to build applications that work both fast on the browser but also are delivered fast to the user. A um, couple of real-world scenarios. Uh, one. My app went down on a Saturday, and the CDN saved the day. And it is amazing once you know that a CDN even allows that. Like, the first time I realized that, I was like, what? It can do that? It's actually, but you have to know what settings have to be put in the CDN for it to do that. So talk to your DevOps engineer and make sure, if you're running a website, that you know what those settings are. Every CDN has a different setting. But once you put that setting, you can test your site and you can make sure that if, even if your node application went down, your front end is still up for all the users across the world. Uh, another cool feature, and this gets me really excited about the future of CDNs. Uh, I know I can't believe I'm saying that. Uh, but um, what's very exciting is usually as an app developer, we think every feature request has to be done in our application. I, like, no, an application request for us was get, a, based on the user's IP, figure out which part of the world this user is from. I was like, okay, I think I can do that. A couple of Google searches, and I realized there's a MaxMind database that I can use, and I can, like, buy that database or figure that out and use it. But did you know that your CDN can do the same? So you really don't have to write a single line of code to do that you can literally have your CDN configured that connects to the database, it does all of that work for you, and then your application just gets the data about the user. That's pretty awesome. Internally, we've also used uh, uh, it for A-B testing, our site, and providing different uh, uh, UIs to different users, and that can be done at the edge, as well as uh, I'm personally exploring Lambda on the edge, which basically provides serverless along with uh, CDN, so that's, that's a very interesting architecture. Uh, so, Wrapping this all up, we started as a developer who knew a little bit about Node applications. We knew that there was the cloud, but we didn't know what was in the cloud. And hopefully through this presentation, you now know what the various parts of the cloud are and how it's super accessible, and you as a developer can actually spin it all up and become a better developer. Uh, I leave you with this one thought that the reason uh, of exploring all of this is not because you want to be a DevOps engineer. That is not the point of this. The point of this is so that we all are curious developers and we build that skill of curiosity in us so that we don't look at what we do at work as whether it's my bubble of front-end or back-end or DevOps, but look at it more holistically because then only will we be able to deliver experiences that are world-class and that can make all our lives easier. Thank you. So I take a few questions. Do we have time for questions or I, I, TTL is low? I Do you know what TTL stands for? No. TTL? 
Time to lunch. Uh, <laughs> good, that's good. That's, okay. that's the demo of people speaking. That's good. I like that. Let's go for two questions. Two questions. Okay. Uh, do you think serverless is the future? Does it scale well? Can it be a performance hit when expecting a lot of requests? Uh, okay. So three questions, really. Uh, do you think serverless is the future? Uh, no, not really. The uh, reason to believe that is I think there are a lot of applications that benefit from a serverless architecture where you don't have to spin up your application um, uh, and keep it up. And I'm actually like, you know, trying to see how those patterns work for content-based websites. But uh, based on discussions I've had with uh, other folks in my team where we are talking about this, we feel the cost that will be there for serverless versus having an instance that is reserved. So you should look into pricing of AWS. That's a fascinating place. Uh, so pricing, like if you have reserved instances versus on-demand instances versus spot instances versus serverless, when you look at pricing, that's where I feel it'll be hard for serverless to scale and be, uh, be cost effective, if that is the right word. Uh, does it scale well? Honestly, don't know. I will be using serverless for a chatbot that I wrote. I think it's a very good fit for applications like that, which are event-driven, so I'm, I'll find out if it scales well. Um, can it be a performance hit when expecting a lot of requests? Yes, certainly. I do believe I was having uh, that discussion. I think it will have a, a performance hit. Uh, what's your opinion on Docker? We have just started using Docker internally. Uh, previously, we were not using Docker. Um, my opinion of that is that it, it's, a, it's, a good, uh, it's a good way for us as developers not to worry about setting up your, our environments. And while I think that is good, I still feel developers need to know the concepts of, like, even though you have Docker, you'll have Nginx running in Docker. You'll have like, all these ELBs running in Docker. So it's a complementary technology, not a not a, kind of a substitute. So rest of the questions, I'll be in the node corner. Thank you so much.